The book of Ezekiel 34, verse 26, God says, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. The key word we learned last week is that God has seasons of blessings. As believers, we think we must be blessed all day, every time. No, there are seasons where blessings or showers, if you will, will come. And so it's not a strange thing that as a believer, there comes a season in your life where you go through a period of difficulty because it doesn't rain all day. Harvest don't come all day. There also comes a season where you might feel sick in your body. There comes a season in your life where you might be going through financial challenges. There might be seasons in your life where something might be going wrong in your life. It doesn't mean God left you. No, it's just an indication that it's a different season from the season previously. And David understood that. I love David because David said, you know what? When I fall, do not laugh at me. A lot of people are quick to laugh when people fall. Because there are three places you could be. You can't be in those three places at the same time. It's either you are going through a challenge right now. Or you just came out of one. Or you're getting ready to go into one. <laughs> so when you find me in a challenge, don't be quick to judge me. Don't be quick to laugh at me. Because you might be laughing yourself into one that is worse than what I'm going through. And that is why David made that statement that do not rejoice over me, O oh my enemy, when I fall. And then he goes on to say that for every falling of the believer, God makes a provision of rising. And I personally believe that falling is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is you remaining in a fallen state. If our believers don't fail, I've come to that realization that if you're a Christian, you can never fail. In fact, until I knew that truth, I could recount how many areas of my life I have failed. But when I got un that understanding, I realized that I have never failed in life before. That might sound very arrogant and prideful, right? But that is the nature of God. What you go through that you call failure to God, it is an experience. There are certain experiences that school can never teach you. There are certain experiences you have under your belt that none of the educational systems of the world could have taught you. The only place that could have taught you is the hard knocks of life. So God allows you to go through those situations so you can learn from them. And this is what I love about God. God never wastes experiences. He uses them all. And that is why the Bible says that all things work together for good. It's only good when you are called with a purpose. Now, when you don't know that you have a purpose, uh, you might be going through stuff and complaining. When I understood that, anything that happens in my life, thank you, Jesus. You know, back in the days, if people walked out of my life, especially people that I love so much, when they walk out of my life, I got so hurt. And I began to ask questions. Why are they leaving? Why did I leave? What did I do wrong? Did I do anything to them? Did I hurt them? I will beat myself. I will ask myself all kinds of questions. Until I read a scripture where Jesus said, Guys, until you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be part of my ministry. And the Bible says that day everybody left his church. And then he turned to the pastors, 12 of them. And he says, does any of you also consider checking out? And then Peter stood up on behalf of the class and said, sir, we're not going anywhere. To whom shall we go? Because we know you have the words of life. But everybody in Jesus' church left. Because they said, how dare you tell us that you, you, we should be vampires to drink your blood and eat your flesh. We're not doing that. What kind of ministry is it? Now you're sounding very occultic. We don't want to be part of your ministry. They walked away. Then Jesus comes out and says, you know what? Don't be surprised that folks left the church because you cannot even be here if my father didn't give you to me. There are certain people that are going to come into your life for a season. And they come in for a season for a purpose. And some of them, once your purpose is done, they're going to go. They have to go. Some of them will even come into your life by being in your belly for nine months. 
You're going to drop them and you will feel as though you own them. Some of you will call, oh, that's my doctor son. Because you took them to school to become doctor, you possess them, you own them. No. A time is going to come and to the mothers who call their sons my boyfriend, they're going to break your heart when they bring their girlfriends home. <laughs> because a time is going to come, they have to go. And if your kids are going to go, what makes you think that people that are not even blood related are not going to leave? They will leave. And you must learn to say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you, Jesus. I may not understand why they just left, but thank you, Jesus. Some of them will, will even live without saying bye-bye to you. Some of them will even live without saying thank you for the good you did to me when you've been so good to them. But you must still be able to say thank you, Lord. Because the Bible says in all things, not some things, not in the things that you love. He says in all things, whether it hurts or not. He says in all things, you got to give him praise. Praise is a weapon. We don't realize that. Praise is a weapon. That is why when you're going through challenges, you don't feel like praising God. You don't feel like coming to church. You don't feel like singing a song. You don't feel like doing anything godly. The devil makes you think that you must hate God in this situation. If he loves you so much, why would he allow you to go through this? <laughs> when we went for Ivan's graduation, and, and, and the officers that trained them, some of the things they would say to them, just to break them emotionally. And by the time they are done going through the training, half of them are gone back home. Because they will make statements to you. That will break you. They want to see how strong you are emotionally. Your parents hate you. That's why they allowed you to come here. Stand up! They will match you 5 a.m. Let's go for drill. Hot sun. What state did you have your training? South Carolina. Yours was not as hot as your sister's place. It was hot. Over 100 degrees. And you got to be in the sun. Now when you're so black, when you turn, what color do you become? Purple or green? <laughs> Man, it's crazy. And they will tell you all kinds of things. Scream on you. Intimidate you. To see whether you are ready for the next level of your life. And that's why the devil is screaming at you. The devil is using the people you love to come against you to check you out. Whether you are prepared, you are ready, do you have capacity for the next level? That's all it is about. All the things we are going through is to check us out. Whether we are ready for next level blessing. Next level harvest. Do you have the capacity God is going to increase this church. We're going to see 500 people, thousands of people as an usher. God is suddenly going to bring some people with attitude. Are you ready for the crowd? You're already overwhelmed. He's going to bring all kinds of people. Check you out. You said you're an usher for three years. Are you ready for the next harvest? This is just one person with attitude. You're going to have 15 every Sunday. You're going to have 35. Are you ready for it? You said you want to be the one cooking downstairs for the people when church is over. And they're going to come receiving free food with an attitude. Are you ready? Are you ready? Ask somebody, are you ready? We call it the harvest, but the question is, are we ready? Are we ready? The harvest indeed is going to come. Because the laws of the harvest is the harvest is bountiful. It's ready. It's ripe. It's going to come. But the question is, are we ready? the question. Harvest, we got to be intentional about it. One of the things I shared with you is the first thing you want to do is to define your field. What is a field given to me for my harvest? And we read a book of Deuteronomy 22 verse 9 through 10. Bible says you shall not sow your vineyard with diverse kinds of seed lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not plow with an axe and an ox and a donkey together. God gives us this because he wants you to define the field he's given you because you can't plant everything in every field. There are certain plants that will just not do well in certain places. We drove from Athens to Corinth and we went on this huge mountain, beautiful place and the only things I saw grown on this mountain around the church of Corinth were olives, lemon, 
and lion. What a combination. Thousands of acres and all you see, olives, lime, and lemon. Nothing else would thrive in the area. Possibly bring the same thing here. I haven't seen olives in America. I don't know. There might be places where they plant olives. But I haven't. In this region at least. In New York. I haven't seen olives. I haven't. When you go to the west coast. They have a lot of grape vines. Where they make all the grape juices. They make all the wines. When you drive in those areas. You could even smell. The, the, the threshing and the, and, the, and the pressing of the grapes. Because they do well in that area. So every field has a specific plant that goes into that place. And God says, don't sow your vineyard with all kinds of seed. This is a season, as a child of God, you must define where God wants you to be. It can be at all over the place. Define where does God want me to be. And it's okay. It's okay to find that field and put everything you have into that field. Say, Lord, show me my field. Lord, open my eyes to see my field. Hallelujah. God wants us to know our field. And we spoke about that last week. The book of Matthew 6.25 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Translation, you cannot be involved in more than one. If God says this is it, this is it. Stick to it. The book of James chapter 1 verse 7 and 8 says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Which man? A double-minded man. Bible says he's unstable in all his ways. God wants you to have singleness of eyes. And we read that in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 22 where the Bible says the light of the body is the eye. It is the eye that brings illumination to the body. And the Bible says, therefore, if your eye is single, the whole body shall be full of light. I don't need a bunch of eyes to have light. I just need one. Amen. So if God has brought you to this church, don't have a private prophet somewhere. You set yourself up for confusion. You set yourself up for confusion. And the enemy loves that. Anything with more than one head represents the beast. Read the book of Revelation. Yes. Some of us have a prophet for money. When it comes to your financial matters, you have a prophet in Uganda. The name has to be strong, Uganda. <laughs> prophet of Uganda. And then you have one in Zimbabwe. <laughs> Powerful names, okay? So when you need something about marriage, you have to call that prophet. Bible says you have an unction. It's in the Bible. It says you have an unction. Unction means anointing. Anointing means ability. It says you have an anointing. And if you pay attention to that anointing, which is the Holy Spirit who is in the inside of you, you don't even need any man to tell you what to do. That's what the Bible says. You have that unction. You have that anointing. You have that ability. And if you pay attention to the Holy Spirit, who is your greatest partner, you need no man to tell you what to do. How do you take yourself thousands of years back into the Old Testament where you needed to see a high priest to talk to God on your behalf whilst you are living in a dispensation of grace where the Bible says, come unto me, come boldly. Don't even come afraid. Come confidently. Come boldly to the throne of grace. That you may obtain no judgment, no judgment. Because sometimes we feel we are being judged, so we can't go into the presence of God. He says, so you can obtain mercy when you are in need. So why do we run to people rather than running to daddy? Why do we run to men rather than running to God? My job as a pastor is to point you to Jesus. It's not to point you to me. When I become indispensable in your life, I have become a God. And I refuse to be a God. 